This is a story about the best of intentions. Tell me, do you ever still feel isolated, alone, lost? Like the world is a heavy summer blossom falling open all around you. But here you are, still locked up inside the quarantine of your own mind. Enough to make a person tip just slightly over the brink. How close are you to your own dark side? Have you asked yourself, what kind of time bomb is ticking inside the confines of my own soft flesh? Maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe nothing does. So why not enjoy a little frivolous entertainment? This is the third thrilling installment in a series of four world premiere audio dramas entitled 1918-2020. Each episode takes you between two worlds, vastly different, yet sickeningly so similar. We give you The Carrier. Hello, dear readers. It's me, C.W.C. Wolsey. Your calm in the storm, your canary in the coal mine, your voice of reason ready to vaccinate the virus of pandemic panic. I am proud to pen this weekly editorial as presented by the New York Gazette Post-Tribune Globe, America's finest and most historically accurate periodical paper. I call this column the Pandemic Log, or Plog, wherein I, C.W.C. Wolsey, will deliver you tips, tricks, and sound advice to thrive in these trying times. Now that the Spanish flu, or as I like to call it, the forbidden dance of the flu mango, has forced us all to stay at home, have you found yourself saddled with your offspring and forced to take up the mantle of educator? Allow me to be of service. Many of you may be stuck at home with children. And of course, by children, I mean anyone under the working age of eight years old. So, if your progeny hasn't gone off to work at a factory or in a mine, you'll want to make sure they are getting a good, proper American education. Here's what I do. I wake them up at 4.30 a.m. We raise the flag, say the Pledge of Allegiance, then off to chemistry, where they cook me eggs and crispy lard. After which, the boys learn mathematics, and the girls walk back and forth across the room with a book balanced upon their heads. Remember to smile, girls. It makes the men happy. Then down for a nap, up for a run, and a little physical education. Calisthenics. Some time jostling on the old vibrating belt. And something I like to call CrossFit. That's where the children run across town so I can fit in a glass of bourbon. When they arrive back, we learn a little history, more mathematics, some elocution, cursive handwriting, and of course, abstinence. By this point in the day, it is likely 1 or 2 p.m., and you may find your young ones getting a bit restless. This is an easy problem to solve. I simply take the child in question, escort them from the classroom, bend down, make full eye contact, and tell them they aren't good enough. Then sit them on a short stool facing the corner and placing a large dunce's cap upon their diminutive head. If you don't have a dunce's cap, just use a cup of your wife's most conical brassiere. Easy as pie. We should pay teachers less. I'm C.W.C. Wolsey, and this has been another entry into the pandemic law. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you about the night that I escaped death. It was 1918. I had just gotten back from the war and I was looking for work. There weren't a lot of job openings for a young man such as myself. Sure, I was a veteran, a trained logistical expert. But I also left a few things over there in the trenches. Namely, some of my left ear, most of my right eye, and all of my will to live. And of course, just as I arrived back in the States, as luck would have it, I was out of the firing range, but right back into the fire. The hot, hot fever of the Spanish flu. So I took up residence in a rat-infested boarding house, and I accepted a job I never should have taken. One of the only places hiring during quarantine was helmed by a Mr. J. Bezeson. That's right, of J. Bezeson's amazing deliveries delivered. Everything you need door-to-door, -door, rain or shine, and sickness and in health. When business gets tough, the Beezersons get going. 
I was to be a carrier, delivering essential supplies far and wide. I usually started at 5 a.m. and ended just shy of midnight. I would lose count of the packages I delivered and be worn down and cross-eyed with exhaustion by the end of the day. It was grueling work, long hours, but at least the pay was terrible. So there I was, lugging everything from powdered blush and paper dolls to toupee glue and mustache wax. You know, essential supplies. Some parts of the job weren't so bad. Most people were delighted to see a friendly face, even if I had to make the drop from six feet away. Got those light bulbs for you, sir! Hup. Two cases of freshly brewed beer! Hup. Enjoy your chandelier, ma'am! Perhaps I wasn't their best carrier. It often felt the only thing keeping me from being unceremoniously fired was the number of young men coming down with the virus. However, after I accidentally sat on a fragile pallet carrying a shipment of exotic pet parrots, Mr. Beezison called me into his office, and I was sure my time as a carrier was about to come to a close. Can you imagine my shock when he entrusted me with a special delivery? I was to take one, only one, package, and deliver it to a prominent resident whom Mr. Beezison knew personally. It was a small, well-wrapped plain parcel that I was instructed to handle with great care and journey with several hours to an estate far outside of town. When I picked it up, I felt a twitching inside, as if something had sprung to life. I held it to my ear. I didn't like that at all. I asked Mr. Beezison what was in the box. Lord knows I didn't want to be complicit in delivering someone some kind of ticking time bomb. But Mr. Beezison just said what he always said, that it was none of my business, that I was lucky to have a job and to stay away from the union men. So off I went, occasionally stopping to examine the small thumping parcel. Was it some kind of creature? A wind-up kitty toy? Perhaps it was only a clock. Either way, I figured Mr. Beezison was right. It was indeed none of my business. So I quickened my pace. It was a long way, and I wanted to make sure I got there before it got too dark. The map Beezison provided had me taking a shorter route through a thick patch of woods, but I stuck to the busier roads for as long as I could. I didn't like the idea of being alone with the ticking box for too long. The longer I walked, the more remote things got and towards the end of my journey, I was sure I had to be lost. But just as I was about to retrace my steps, I saw one lone house looming atop a sloping hill, far in the distance. It wasn't raining, but I swear I still heard thunder. I finally reached my destination just as the sun was starting to set. It was a crumbling estate that seemed to be on the verge of collapse. It almost appeared to sway in the breeze on the precipice of its perch. There was a steep stone staircase leading up to the house. I took a deep breath and started my ascent. As I climbed the slippery stairs, I could hear the noise within the box increase, get faster, more frenetic, almost as if it were afraid. I arrived at the top of the hill and found myself in front of an imposing wrought iron gate. I unlatched the hinge and stepped inside. Upon entering the estate, I was overcome by an urgency to finish my delivery as quickly as possible. As I walked towards the door, I could barely distinguish the beating of my own terrified heart from the thumping within the parcel. But I pressed on, through the overgrown thatch, up the uneven cobblestones, until I was standing in front of a once grand gilded front door. With a shaking hand, I reached up and felt for the doorbell. No one answered. Hello? Anyone there? Nothing. I very lightly pressed my palm against the door. Hello? 
Delivery. Jay Visason's amazing delivery is delivered. Anyone there? My cries echoed through the cavernous halls. The entirety of the estate seemed absolutely desolate. Just as I was about to leave, I heard the faintest cry, almost imperceptible, accompanied by a slight sound of metal striking metal. I strained into the foyer, trying to decipher what it was. On shaking feet, I advanced into the hall, and I saw a light, dim at first, and then brighter. A flickering, the kind of light thrown by a flame. Everything inside me said to turn around, drop the package, leave. But my military mindset urged me to continue. We were in a quarantine. I couldn't leave someone stranded. Who knows when the next able-bodied man would be present to help. Hello? Delivery? Everything all right? My cries were met with the faintest of replies. Please, down here. I followed the sound to a set of cellar stairs. Again, I was hit by a wave of dread. The parcel under my arm was throbbing, vibrating with such vigor I almost couldn't keep a hold. I advanced down the stairs into the lower chamber of the house, slowly, for what felt like an eternity. All the while, allowing the sound of the woman's voice below to guide me closer. Yes! Down here, please. I'm here. When I reached the bottom of the stairs, I was met with a sudden, blinding light. The intensity of it rendered me momentarily stupefied. Everything in my field of vision was reduced to flashing beams. The sound! The sound! It was deafening! Then, an echoing silence as I stood there frozen in the dark. The only sound in the room seemed to be coming from a far corner. A human sound, heavy, labored breathing. Hello, madam, are you all right? But then my voice was strangled by terror. As my eyes adjusted to the dim light, I saw a scene that I was first unable to comprehend. It was a battlefield. It was a butcher shop. It sent a wave of hot nausea through me and left me retching, cold sweat covering my face. The parcel slipped from my grasp and landed with a wet slap. Everywhere my gaze fell a new horror. The room was glutted with flesh, some fresh, some in states of decay. Hands, arms, legs, torsos, heads lay cast on tables, perched on cruelly hewed metal frames. The floor was red with blood, so much blood, blood like a river. I turned to run, but my foot could not gain purchase on the slick floor. I slipped, and my head hit the edge of a wooden table with a sickening crack. And all the lights went out. Oh my, well, we hate to leave you like this, stranded, navigating a river of blood, so why don't you just grab your nearest tourniquet and apply a little pressure? We'll be right back. Well, all right, now take that tourniquet off and allow yourself to bleed out for the exciting conclusion of The Carrier. When I came to, I sensed someone standing above me, a dark figure framed by firelight. I started to scream, but all I could utter was a small, strangled moan. Did someone whisper? Or did I imagine it? I was paralyzed, fixed to a long leather chair, every inch of me strained and clasped. In that moment, I knew that I was on the verge of death. 
that I had crossed over into a place where there was no going back. Even on my belly in the blood-soaked trenches, I had never felt such inevitability. My senses started to return, and I was able to get a good look at the face of my captor. She was ancient, wizened, unkempt, frazzled, demented, and reeked of madness. But there was also something kind, intelligent, and curious, like an owl, or a mouse staring up at an owl. Words bubbled up in my throat and poured out of my mouth. Please, don't kill me. I will never forget the way she smiled. Soft, warm, doting. Her eyes glistened with tears. I would never. It took ages for my order to arrive. Why would I do anything to harm it? Thinking I could bargain with this mad woman, my shaky voice pleaded, Your order is over there. I may have dropped it. I'm very sorry. <laughs> she laughed and laughed. She leaned into me and whispered, <laughs> breath foul and hot. You are what I ordered. That box is just a little gift. Something I had made just for you. She retrieved the box from the sticky, viscera-covered floor. <laughs> Allow me. She gently opened the box to reveal something half-flesh, half-gear. It twitched and shuddered in the light of the laboratory. The thump I had come to be so familiar with. The confusion in my eyes spurred her on. <gasps> Do you like it? It took me ages to perfect the design, and even longer to find the right manufacturer. The Swiss do have a way with clockwork, and I do believe this little pump is the missing piece my previous experiments had gone without. Oh, you have no idea how lucky you are. <laughs> I am going to save you. In fact, I am going to save all of mankind. <laughs> All these men working on a vaccine. Oh, so short-sighted. What happens after we cure Spanish flu? In 10, 20, 100 years? Another pandemic will come along, take our grandparents, our children, our young men. But I'm not <sighs> sick. She laughed and started to pace, <laughs> frantically assembling tools and metal implements. Not yet, not yet. <laughs> and you never will be. I've found a way to transcend sickness, decay, maybe even death. <laughs> and it works. I have experimented, and I have succeeded many, many, many times over. My first attempt was with Mother, but her flesh rejected the metal frame. And with Father, I was much closer, <laughs> but hadn't quite gotten a hang of a clockwork pump to inflate the lungs. By the time I got to our household staff, I had almost all the kinks worked out. <laughs> Except for one final problem. You see, when I mechanized them, something in their brains always misfired. They awoke, rabid, unrelenting, terrified, yet belligerent, frail and forceful all at once. They had lost their humanity, and I had to. Well, honestly, death was a mercy. But you, boy, you, with your fresh, hot brain coils, you, I believe, will be soft and pliable enough to survive the full mechanization procedure. And with my new clockwork heart pump, more blood to the brain, more cognitive function. You'll be the first of many. I have used my considerable inheritance to work out a yearly delivery of these same Swiss heart pumps and their carriers to create a race of mechanized men. And 
and perhaps a few women, who I will teach the art of mechanization and so on and so forth, until we are all merged with machines, safe from biological threats, ready to transcend death. And then her hand brought a cloth down over my face and I sunk into darkness. I woke hours, days, who knows how long. I was untethered, my restraints removed. I lay on a cold operating table. The room was silent except for a faint, ragged breath. I was groggy, but I was alive. I scanned the room for my captor, and there she was, draped in a chair in the far corner, sickly, feverish, face pockmarked with black spots. I do not know if she had been infected already, or if I had brought the virus with me. She stirred slightly and met my gaze. She let out one final sigh, and I watched her eyes dull and sink. She was gone. I was alone. I felt a strange calm come over me. I had lived. I had escaped death. Hey, what's up? Uh, no, sorry, I can't text right now. I'm driving. Uh, yeah, I'll pick everything up when I'm done with work. Oh, and I'll stop by Casey's and grab the starter dough. Okay, I, I hear you, but my mask is on, my hands are sanitized, and nothing is being signed for. Every delivery I make is 100% contact free. It's perfectly safe. Listen, you have to stop fighting me on this. I, I don't know when the restaurants are going to open up, and we need income. I can't ask my parents for rent again, and my mom just got laid off. Unless you want to use the wedding fund. I mean, if you want to dip into that, then then sure, I'll quit this stupid carrier service, and we can just watch Netflix until there's a vaccine, right? <laughs> Hello? Oh, my God. Hello? Hello? Uh, d don't be mad. Are you mad? Oh, okay, hi. Uh, when did I cut out... Uh, no, no, never mind. Never mind. I didn't say anything. I just... I'm just saying you don't have to worry. Is it raining where you are? Because it is crazy here. I'm being safe. I actually only have one delivery. It's just really far away. Oh my god. Did you see my text about the package? No, no. I, I sent a video too. It is literally beating. Like, like pulsing. It's definitely not a bomb. <laughs> I shook it, and it didn't feel like a bomb. First of all, it's way too small to be a bomb. And second, you're not allowed to ship bombs. They have scans and stuff to stop that. And, and by the way, thanks for putting that into my head. I'm, I'm not already driving in the rain, out in the middle of nowhere with a weird little box that probably has something pretty gross inside it. Oh, yeah, you know exactly what I mean. Anyway, I'm here and I should probably let you go. Love you too. Wait, uh, are you still there? Um, I'm not saying there's anything dangerous, but just maybe hang on the phone until I drop this thing off. Yeah, there's a staircase and it looks pretty slippery and it's not super well lit. You know that old creepy house? The one that looks like it's about to fall apart. You can kind of see it from the highway. <laughs> yeah, well, this place is like 10 times scarier. Just keep talking to me so I know I still have bars, okay? Oh, man. 
I gotta work on my cardio. I've definitely gained that COVID-25. Hey, hello? Still there? Oh, ow, oh! Hey, yeah, I just tripped. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. I, I got this, I got this. Okay, I got this. Oh, Woo. Okay, I'm here. Wow, I wish you could see this. It's, it's pretty awesome. Really classic spooky iron gate. So, um, I'm walking up to the door. I just need to let the person know their stuff is here and we're good to go. One second. Hello? Delivery? Man, I hope someone's there. I don't have to come back. Whew. Oh. What? Um, hold on. I, I think someone just answered me. Do not hang up. Hello? Hey, um, hello? Oh. Delivery? Okay. The door is unlocked. That's a bad sign, right? I I'm not going in. I I'll just make sure the package is inside the door, and then I'm done. Hey, I I've got your package. I'm just gonna drop it off inside the door. So, um, so don't shoot me, cause I'm, I'm just a delivery guy. Help, can you help me? Oh my God. Oh, the smell in here is, hello? Oh, listen, I don't know if you can hear or not, but something is very wrong here. Hey, are you? Are you okay? Please help me. Okay, I'm, I'm pretty sure I lost you, but I'll call you right back. And, and if you don't hear from me in like 20 minutes, just call 911, okay? Hello? Please help me. Okay, I'm hanging up. I'm sure it's fine. I'll, um, I'll call you right back. Um, I love you. Okay. Okay, I'm coming in. Uh, where are you? Down there. All right. Please, hurry. All right. Fine. Okay. Okay. Just be a good person. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. Okay. Um, is there a light? frightening to see my past uh, attempts. I'm no scientist, but I've had some years of practice now, so I don't think it will turn out like that for you. No, this time I think I've got it. You don't know what it's been like to be so isolated. She meant to make more, but then she didn't. And I can't just, I can't go out there like this. Which is why, Which is why, why you, you don't need to be scared. I'm going to save you. I'm so very glad you're here. Shh. It's okay. Before we begin, I will tell you everything. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you about the night that I escaped death. Hello, dear 
your readers. It's me, C.W.C. Wolsey, with this week's Pandemic Log. In today's Pandemic Log, or Plog, I will deliver you tips, tricks, and sound advice to thrive in these trying times. Now that the Spanish flu, or as I like to call it, the Matadoria, a.k.a. Cortez's Revenge, has ravaged our great nation, have you come down with a deadly case of germophobia? Allow me to help. Germs! They are everywhere, in the air, on your hands, in the mouth of your wife, and your mistress, and her lover, and his mistress, and her dentist, and his florist, and her betrothed, and his wife, and her best friend, and her postal man, and his dentist, and his milkman, and his dog walker, and her husband, and his haberdasher, and the president of the United States of America, and his wife, and her priest. Germs are everywhere. We are all going to die. Oh, God. So you should wash your hands and wear a mask. I'm CWC Wolsey, and this has been another entry into the pandemic log. And that was The Carrier. The cast featured in this episode include James Kleinman as our 1918 carrier, Eric Davy Gislason as our 2020 carrier, and the aptly cast part of The Mad Genius was played by me, Ali Silva. The Carrier was written by Liz Leiser and Ricardo Delgado and directed by Ali Silva. Chris Woolsey plays CWC Woolsey and he co-wrote the plogs with Liz Leiser. Fireside Mystery Theater is produced by Gustavo Rodriguez and me for Fireside Mystery Productions. Music for this episode was performed by Nico Slater. Liz Leiser is our operations guru. Casey LaForest is our social media maven. Faith Johnson is our production coordinator. Jason Graves composed our theme music. I manage our audio production, post-production, and sound design. For this episode, I also had a fabulous sound design partner in the very excellent Ricardo Delgado. A tremendous amount of work goes into creating and crafting every episode of Fireside Mystery Theater. And no doubt we do it because we love it. But it's the support of our Patreon patrons that helps us to grow and to sustain those efforts. Our patrons put the fuel in our tanks to keep our engines running. If you are already an FMT Patreon patron, you will always be our hero. And I assure you, as our hero, you will never be unsung. If you're not yet a patron, but toying with the idea, go ahead and sign up today. It's easy and the perks are sweet. Just go to patreon.com slash fireside mystery theater or follow the links from our website. We have all kinds of rewards, including our latest ad-free episodes as a bonus for $5 or more per month patrons. We are immensely grateful for any support you can give to help us keep the embers of our fireside flickering. Times are lean for many of us, and we know that not everyone is in a place where supporting us through Patreon is feasible. But there is a way to support us that doesn't cost but a moment of your time. A kind rating and review not only thrills us to no end, it also gives us a boost in podcasting world ways that we don't even fully understand. And we absolutely ride high on the ego boost too. So do it on Apple Podcasts or Podchaser and totally make our day. Just remember, the mother of invention is necessity. But the mother of necessity may be madness, and the mother of madness wanted me to remind you to never, ever mind the shadows. Go ahead, step right in. That's what we always say here, right? I'm fine. Everything's fine. Everything's fine.